object which is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, maybe another title for this talk could be how I got into motivic homotopy theory. Um, so if you went to Mike's talk, then you probably learned that when you're young, you want to find whatever the cool tool is and learn what it is and, uh, and use it to prove theorems. And so uh, this talk sort of begins in the same way. It was 1999. Uh, I was a first year grad student, and I would uh, wander over to the institute. And Vovodsky was giving these lectures on, uh, uh, I guess, the proof of the Milner conjectures and motivic cohomology and all these things. And I don't remember much of these lectures except for just one thing, which was that every week Vovodsky would show up, and he would always have a cup of tea, and he would stand at the sort of right side of the podium or the, the, the stage, and he would look out the window, and he would sip his tea, and he would just kind of ramble for 20 minutes or so. And, uh, and then eventually he would start writing a few words on the blackboard. But what I really remember from those talks is just him staring out the window and sipping on his tea. Um, and in principle, there was something really amazing going on. There was this sort of motivic homotopy theory being developed. But I sort of didn't get it from that lect those lectures. And um, for those of you who are aware of it, there was a book that came out later by Maza, Weibel, and Vovodsky, uh, which is called Lectures on Motivic Homology. And um, I was shocked to learn that those were lecture notes from that course, because as far as I could tell, it had nothing to do with what was discussed in the lectures. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it left a great impression on me. I, I, I was really like, amazed by the sort of vibe that was around there. And I think around the same time, maybe a little bit later, uh, so I started learning some algebraic geometry and some group actions and stuff like that and trying to find my way in the kind of mathematics that I would eventually do. And uh, in 2003, Fabian Morel came to the Institute for Advanced Study and he gave these Morse lectures on motivic algebraic topology. And uh, I just remember, again, I don't remember the details of the lectures anymore, but I do remember sort of being blown away by his, his viewpoint and I think, uh, it's just, it was an amazingly inspiring collection of lectures. And while I won't mention his name so much in this talk, I think his, his influence on this subject, as I'm sure as you all know, as you've seen through these last weeks, has been absolutely immense. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some things from a historical standpoint. And that's always dangerous. I think whenever historians watch mathematicians talk about history, they kind of roll their eyes. Um, and it's kind of some poor man's version of that. But what I'd like to start with, uh, so the disclaimer is don't, uh, don't pay attention to that, the history so much. Uh, it's going to be kind of revisionist anyway. Um, so one of the things that I learned from Fabien, uh, which I think was laid out pretty clearly in his ICM note in 2006, was this vision that there should be kind of an approach to the study of algebraic varieties, which was kind of like, the surgery approach in topology. So we should be able to build algebraic varieties in some sense by cutting and pasting. Uh, and sort of homotopy theory should give us some insight into the classification of algebraic varieties. So I'd like to take that really seriously and start there. All right, so rambling start. But uh, I'm going to start with this question, what is a sphere? All right. So a while ago, I used to like to ask people, you know, when you think about a topological space, people usually have a mental model. And so my mental model was usually something like the circle or the sphere. Uh, I thought Paul Balmer was going to be here. So he's not, I guess. But I'm going to throw him under the bus anyway. Um, so I asked Paul Balmer this question. I said, when you think about a topological space, what do you think of? Anyone want to guess his, his answer was? He said, the letter X. All right, so this talk is going to be quite far from that. All right, so what is a sphere? There's a pictorial point of view. We have this object in mind. Or maybe we just have the letter S in mind. I don't know. So from the time of the Greeks, we've known that a sphere is the collection of points that are equidistant from a given point. And so we draw this pictorial representation of it. But as soon as we've given this kind of description, then we also get an algebraic description. And the reason for that is that we know how to measure distances in terms of the distance formula. And so there's an algebraic answer to this question. 
And by rescaling, well, I'll say that it's the solution to the equations x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And importantly, it's in the real numbers. All right. So back at this time, algebraic geometry and topology were not divorced yet. You see an algebraic equation, and you see a topological space, but neither of those notions is really present yet. All right. OK, but what is a sphere? I mean, is it this, or is it something else? Well, we can change our notion of distance. So let's take a slightly different notion of distance. Instead of measuring in terms of squares, we can use core fourth powers or sixth powers. And uh, you can plot those things, too. And those are the unit ball or the unit sphere in some other metric. They look a little bit less like spheres, but you can imagine how to get from one to the other. If you take a straw and poke it in there and just blow, you can imagine getting continuously from the sphere to each of these other things. So let me just observe that when we change this notion of distance, we've lost something. We've broken symmetry. The sphere on the left is rotationally symmetric. So uh, There's a nice group theoretic description as well. It's a quotient space of the special orthogonal group SO3, and the stabilizer of a point is SO2. I'll come back to that a lot later. But there is some relationship between these things because they can be continuously deformed to each other. All right. But if we're going to allow continuous deformation, then maybe we should go all the way, and uh, we should also include things like this. So. Uh, this space here looks quite different from those above. Up there, things are nice and smooth, whereas here, I have corners all of a sudden. All right, so at some point, we have to make some choice of the kinds of objects we're going to focus on. And this is something that took a long evolution. So on the one hand, I want to imagine that whatever I'm looking at consists of things like the sphere, and even when I'm thinking about just the sphere, there were things that looked like the sphere in some ways and not the others. Uh, for example, that diamond looked like the sphere in some way, but certainly not in the same way as the, uh, those kind of deformed spheres from x to the fourth and x to the sixth. So after a long period of time, we, uh, we started focusing on this notion of manifolds. Uh, so these are sort of locally Euclidean spaces that have some other global conditions. But I don't want you to think too hard about what precise category we're working in. This is a, it's a much more modern notion. And, and frankly, people didn't care for a really long time. Um, and I'd like to think about these things. And it'll be important to talk about continuous maps between them. But again, uh, this notion of continuous maps and the corresponding notions that it gives rise to, like continuous equivalence, which is known as homeomorphism, or continuous deformation, uh, which we're going to call homotopy, these are things that intuitively existed for a very, very long time, but people didn't bother writing them down. So I said that the sphere goes back to the Greeks. I mean, when I think about the sphere in a more modern sense, I mean, maybe the first person that really looked at that is Riemann. And if you look in Riemann, he didn't bother making any definition of mappings between spaces. Spaces just were just objects that came up. And this kind of what we might call modern, in modern terms, uh, carelessness sort of persisted for a very, very long time. Um, Cantor and Brouwer uh, thought about mappings as continuous bijections, and, uh, or I mean, homeomorphisms as continuous bijections. As we know now, homeomorphisms are not continuous bijections. They're continuous maps with continuous inverses. But you know, these notions were still very, very vague back in those days. <coughs> It wasn't until 1895 that this word homeomorphism was even coined. And when Poincaré wrote it down in his discussion, um, he assumed various differentiability hypotheses. So it wasn't what we would call homeomorphism now. It's m probably closer to what we would call like a C1 mapping or something like that. So the mappings were a little bit weird. Uh, furthermore, if you look at these papers, then all of the spaces were described in embedded terms. You were just literally writing down some equations in some Euclidean space. Uh, and you, know, you didn't try to think about an abstract point of view. So let me just mention that the modern definition of topological space didn't sort of come around until roughly like 1915 or 1916. And the modern definition of a manifold as you know, locally given in terms of charts and gluing didn't exist until the 1930s. Nevertheless, people thought about these objects and understood many things about them without uh, any of these definitions in place. So we'll see later that somehow the precise foundations of 
in the motivic setting have changed a bit, but we can talk about the objects without any foundations in some sense. All right, so I'd like to think about how we build up topological spaces. And um, so let me go back to the sphere. Well, one point of view, which comes from Riemann, is that if I think about the two-sphere, then I can view it as taking the complex line and adding an ideal point at infinity. And if I just take the north pole and remove it, then I can stereographically project and get an identification between the complex line and uh, S2 with the point of inf infinity removed. But we can also build the sphere by cutting and pasting. So I can break the sphere up into its upper and lower hemispheres and uh, take the intersection of those two things and get kind of a, a ring like this. And I can think about the sphere as an identification space. I glue the upper and, hem upper and lower hemispheres along their intersection. And this has some modern notation now. Well, I take that band, that ring, and, and include it in upper and lower hemispheres, which I've indicated with a plus and a minus. And this diagram indicates that I'm gluing those things together. All right, so what's important from this point of view is that those upper and lower hemispheres are identified in a continuous fashion with disks. And those disks can be, uh, can be continuously shrunk to a point. Uh, so they are contractible. All right, so if I want to allow myself this kind of gluing picture and I only want to work up to homotopy, I'll take my disk, so this is sort of very similar to the picture I wrote before, but now I've taken the interval minus epsilon epsilon and I've shrunk it to a point, and I've taken the disks and I've also shrunk those to a point, and I want to say that S2 is sort of glued up to homotopy from S1 and two contractible things. And so this has a picture that goes along, to, along with it as well. I'm going to write S2 as the suspension of the circle, and this is the picture. So I imagine taking S1 and turning it into something contractible by adding a point and then connecting all of the points to that, to that ideal point. So that's like a cone, and that would be something contractible, which is the top right corner. I do the same thing with the bottom left corner. So I get two cones, and I glue them together along a circle in the middle, and that's what the suspension is. All right, great. So I think we can argue that we knew what the sphere was in some sort of invariant terms in after Riemann. Uh, so Riemann introduced this notion of holes, and he showed that S2 has no holes, uh, or it had genus 0. All right. Um, and this led to a kind of characterization of S2 and the Euclidean two space R2. So S2 is the only closed connected surface of genus zero. Uh, and R2 is, except to homeomorphism, the only open contractible surface. All right, so this is historical revisionism at its best. Uh, so, well, when we talk about Riemann in this sense, Riemann didn't know what a manifold was. He knew what Riemann surfaces were, and these were usually constructed explicitly by functions that covered C. Uh, and by necessity, those things were oriented. So maybe Riemann knew the classification of oriented surfaces. Uh, again, at least in this time, a lot of these examples were algebraic geometric in nature. They were algebraic curves. Um, we didn't know that the genus was a homeomorphism invariant. In fact, we didn't know what topological invariants meant yet. We knew that there was this number that we could write down that had some sort of significance. But uh, it wasn't until at least 1915 uh, that we knew some sort of topological invariance of the genus. And well, the topological classification of surfaces to which I'm alluding probably wasn't known until the 1920s, because you better have a definition of topological space before you can classify things. So, Nevertheless, I think you read people say that we knew these kinds of things much earlier. Uh, and so I think you can imagine that we can work with these objects even if we don't know precisely what the definitions are. All right. Maybe that's because two dimensions is something that's very familiar. So what happens when we try to use this intuitive idea and go up in dimension? Uh, and when I said historical revisionism, I really mean it. Uh, this second statement 
if you want to get a sort of formal proof of it, the classification of open surfaces, I think, wasn't really completed until the 1960s. There's a paper of Richards from 63. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe we didn't really know that R2 was the unique open contractible surface in, in Riemann's time. All right, so what about higher dimensions? In dimension two, we really have a lot of intuition. We can draw pictures. We can move things around by hand. So what happens in dimension three? All right, so Riemann introduced this notion of genus, counting the number of holes. Later, Betty introduced sort of higher dimensional notions of holes, the so-called Betty numbers. Uh, it's worth pointing out that when these numbers were introduced, they were just numbers. They didn't have an interpretation in terms of groups. Homology groups didn't exist until uh, much later. Even Poincaré, when he thought about homology, didn't think about groups. He thought about matrices and normal forms for matrices. Uh, so Poincaré introduced the fundamental group in 1892, and I think he was interested in knowing whether if you take the three-sphere, so again, you can add one variable to your equation for the, three, for the two-sphere, get some description algebraically, you can not draw a picture of this, but people have spent lots of time trying to visualize how you can think about the three-sphere, for example, in terms of a movie. Um, and Poincaré was interested, well, can you characterize the three-sphere in terms of Betty numbers? Now, Poincaré had this approach to research, which he called the uh, uh, um, research by successive approximations. So he posed a question, and he described some methods, but he wasn't always so careful in writing down carefully the methods. Certainly by modern standards, we wouldn't consider these things rigorous. Um, so when he asked these questions about Betty numbers, they were maybe shouldn't have been thought more of as problems that we could sort of look at or try to solve. All right. So he realized that Betty numbers weren't sufficient to <coughs> characterize uh, the three-sphere, and I then asked whether homology, which he described then, uh, was sufficient to characterize it, and observed that that also wasn't true because he wrote down an example of a space whose homology was the same as the three-sphere, but not a three-sphere itself, the famous dodecahedral space. All right. So, I mean, what did Poincaré think about when he thought, th thought about spaces? Well, you can go back and look, and you can see there are explicit identification spaces. So nowadays, we think of automorphic functions as sort of very far from, from topology. But back then, I mean, when Poincaré was thinking about functions and their invariance properties, uh, these like automorphic functions were very much part of the, the, the theory of Riemann surfaces, for example, uh, and very much in Poincaré's uh, vocabulary. All right, so again, uh, these kinds of things are not sufficient to characterize the three-sphere. But uh, we have this notion of homotopy equivalence, and uh, nowadays what we call the Poincaré conjecture uh, is the assertion that if I have a closed three-manifold that's homotopy equivalent to S3, then it's homeomorphic to S3. But again, I mean, the question of whether you could characterize S3 in some sort of invariant way or by some, some, some sort of numbers or something, I think, is, is much more elementary than this kind of more precise formal consequence. All right, any questions so far? <clears throat> All right, so, so far we're still very much in the late 19th, early 20th century, and we're not going to move too much further. Uh, so there's a lot of effort in this period, as I sort of sketched before, to formalize these definitions and kind of come up with uh, a usable theory of topological spaces. All right, so the title of this slide is based on a famous paper of John Stallings, which is called How Not to Prove the, Coin or How, How Not to Prove the Poincaré Conjecture. Uh, so this may be a, an example of a famous mistake in mathematics. All right, so the Poincaré Conjecture was made in 1904, and then in 1934, Whitehead, J.H.C. Whitehead, announced a proof. So what's the proof? Okay. So. Homotopy equivalences are given by continuous maps. So let's take a homotopy equivalence from some manifold of dimension 3 to S3. Great. What can I do with that? Well, I can take a point out of S3, 
And if I remove a point, continuity tells me that m minus a point to s3 minus of a point is necessarily also a homotopy equivalence. And r3 is, uh, homotop is open and contractible. I mean, by the same sort of radial scaling that we use to contract r2. OK. So m minus a point is open and contractible. But of course, any open and contractible three manifold is homeomorphic to r3. This seems reasonable based on what we know in dimension two. And then by continuity, we can just fill in the point at infinity and we get a homeomorphism from m to s3. So the point gray conjecture is proved. All right, what's wrong with this proof? <laughs> Lots of things. <laughs> so this is a, I think the proof that I wrote there is actually a very stylized version of what Whitehead writes. So uh, you can find the paper, I think it's in topology in 1934 or something like that. But anyway, so three is very different than two. And all of a sudden, the world is completely different. So unlike in two dimensions, there's an open, contractible three-manifold that is not homeomorphic to R3. And the construction of this thing was given by Whitehead just a year later, and it's really, really beautiful. So in fact, this manifold is an open subset of Euclidean three space. So you can even have open subsets of Euclidean three space that are open and contractible, but not R3. The closed complement has a name. It's called the Whitehead continuum, and it's built by one of these beautiful iterative constructions that we learn about in pathologies. Uh, so what you do is you take the unknot, you thicken it a little bit, and then you perform what's called the whitehead double. So you take the unknot again and you embed it into this, uh, into this tubular thickening of the previous unknot, except you link the two ends. All right? And now you do this inductively. You take a small thickening of the embedded uh, unknot, which was this whitehead double, and then you embed the whitehead double in that, and so on and so forth and so forth. So forth. Here's a picture. Uh, this is the whitehead continuum. Uh, so when I was thinking about this back in the day, I had a friend who was an artist, and he managed to uh, give some kind of description of it. In the background, you might be able to see is uh, an explanation of the construction of the whitehead continuum, I think in, uh, I think it's a description of by Stallings. I forget who's, or maybe it's Siebenman, anyway. Um, but this is one of these sort of beautiful, I don't know, I remember like the whitehead horn sphere or something like that, it's sort of reminiscent of those kinds of things. All right, so now we have this open contractible three manifold, and it's still 1934. All right, so in Frederick's talk, we heard a bit about topology from the 1930s to the 1950s, and I'm going to entirely skip that era. So the 1930s to the 1950s was some sort of golden era of geometric and algebraic topology. Morse introduced Morse theory. Uh, bundle theory was introduced. Cobordism, characteristic classes, all these things were studied. And uh, much of what we call modern algebraic topology was sort of codified in this era. And I'm going to completely skip it. But what it allowed us to do it is allowed us to ask a question, which is, is this whitehead continuum, which I wrote down before, some kind of isolated pathology, or is this some kind of general phenomenon? All right, so the answer to that is, well, no. Uh, this is very, very far from being an isolated pathology. In fact, there are uncountably many such spaces in dimension three. And you can even imagine how you could get this if you stare at the construction of the whitehead continuum. I mean, I started from the unknot and I performed some procedure with it. And so what Macmillan does is he performs some variant on that with slightly more complicated knots. And by choosing sort of appropriate sequences, he gets uncountable collections of such things. All right, so now we know that there are lots of these things. So does that mean that there are just lots of such pathologies? Um, and a related question is sort of, does this obstruct the Poincaré conjecture? Um, and is this notion of contractibility sort of intrinsic or to, I mean, is it related to, to the Poincaré conjecture in any way? Um, and maybe I'll just say one word about this and hopefully I'll get to come back to this at the very end of the talk. But 
these spaces have very, very complicated ideal boundary. Um, roughly, if you, the ideal boundary is something like if you take a compact set and you take a larger compact set that contains it and you look at the complement and you sort of allow your things to get bigger and bigger, what, what does sort of the geometry at infinity look like? Um, and so these, these spaces, uh, nowadays sometimes this is also called the end space, um, these compactifications are typically not manifolds and that's sort of important. Uh, in fact, it's even stronger than that. I mean, Wall in 65 showed that you could characterize Euclidean three space uh, if the Poincare conjecture holds. So maybe Whitehead wasn't too far off from, from this point of view. All right, so it still doesn't quite answer my question. I mean, is this an isolated pathology? I've just said now, well, in fact, there are lots of pathologies, but uh, maybe the next question is, is there any structure? Well, before doing that, I mean, this was the, right after the golden era of geometric topology, and so there were a lot of people who were thinking about the surgery classification of manifolds. Uh, Smale had proven the h cobordism theorem and used that to, to understand um, classification of manifolds and of smooth manifolds in high dimensions. And <clears throat> there were lots of works in related topics about PL manifolds and, and topological manifolds. And as a generalization of the kind of construction that was given by, uh, by Macmillan, uh, Curtis and Quinn in 1965 proved that there were uncountably many homeomorphism classes of open contractible manifolds uh, in dimensions bigger than or equal to five. Dimension four was a little bit harder, but it was also solved right around the same time in 1967. All right, so now in every dimension bigger than or equal to four, we have, or bigger than or equal to three, we have uncountably many pairwise non-homeomorphic open contractible manifolds. Um, is there some sort of additional structure? Is, for example, what I suggested was a link between this and the Poincaré conjecture also true in higher dimensions? So maybe one of the crowning achievements of this period is a characterization of Euclidean space. Uh, so for n bigger than or equal to three, Rn is up to homeomorphism. Well, the unique open contractible n manifold, but now I'm gonna impose a condition uh, for R2, I didn't need any other conditions, but for R3, I observed that there are open contractible things that are not homeomorphic to R3. There's an additional condition on using this notion of simple connectivity at infinity. So um, maybe a, a rough way of thinking about this is that the ideal boundary can have a fundamental group and we're asking that that fundamental group is trivial. All right. So as a consequence of this characterization of Euclidean space, we actually get a structure theorem for all these open contractible manifolds. Namely, if you take something that's open contractible and you cross it with the Euclidean line, you automatically get something that is simply connected at infinity. And so by the characterization, it's necessarily going to be Euclidean space. <coughs> all right, so where are we? So now, we're in this, we're in the mid 60s and we have a beautiful characterization of Euclidean space. Uh, maybe I've lied just a little bit. So uh, this result is known again in dimensions bigger than or equal to five. Uh, it's due to Stallings in the PL case and Siebenman in the topological case. And uh, well, dimension four took longer and it uses Friedman's work on four manifolds. Uh, so that wasn't until the mid 80s. And in fact, the characterization of Euclidean space in dimension three is uh, a consequence of the Poincaré conjecture in dimensions three, so it wasn't finished until Perelman finished his proof of the Poincaré conjecture. So these techniques are sort of varied at this point. I mean, in dimension four and dimension three especially, these are very, very different than what happens in dimension five and above. Um, and let me just observe that these statements are equivalent to the topological Poincaré conjecture. So in general, the topological Poincaré conjecture is that if you have a manifold that's homotopy equivalent to SN, then it's homo homeomorphic to SN, and the open version of this, uh, which is the characterization of Euclidean space, is, uh, the, is the top statement. All right, so we now have, if we want, we could summarize all of this in a sort of moral of the story. Uh, in high dimensions, meaning bigger than or equal to three, there's a huge difference between continuous deformation and homeomorphism. Homotopy equivalence and homeomorphism are very, very different notions, and open contractible manifolds are one measure of that difference. 
the theory of open contractible things is extremely rich. I mean, there are lots and lots of examples, uncountably many in every dimension bigger than or equal to three. <coughs> and the theory has what you might call structure. I mean, there's a nice theorem that allows me to pick out Euclidean space amongst open contractible manifolds. And stably, in other words, after forming a Cartesian product with a real line, open contractibles become homeomorphic to Rn. So at least in principle, we can even construct them. If I take a translation action of the real line on some Euclidean space, then every open contractible can be written by as a, as a quotient. All right. OK, so keep that in mind. We have a topological story. I think it's relatively complete. It took quite a long time. We built these objects, which at the beginning were sort of very amorphous. We didn't really care too much about how we were thinking about them, but we had some ideas in mind about what they were, and uh, a theory developed out of them. And we made a bunch of definitions around that theory. <clears throat> All right, so remember at the very beginning, spheres were objects of algebraic geometry. They were given by equations. All right, so let me start with the circle. Okay, over the real numbers, it's given by x squared plus y squared equals 1. But if I work over the complex numbers, I can factor. And uh, in that case, if I just write z equals x plus iy and w is x minus iy, then I can also describe the sphere by the equation zw equals 1. And let me just observe that uh, to write down the inverse, I need to be able to divide by 2. So already 2 plays a special role in uh, the circle. And in terms of ring theory, well, I can look at the functions in two variables uh, modulo this relation that zw equals 1. And that ring is isomorphic as a ring to z of c of zz inverse, just given by projecting onto z. All right. Now, that ring c of zz inverse also has a name. It's sometimes called the multiplicative group. But uh, so let me just write that as a definition, if you will. OK, so uh, zw equals 1 looks very, very different than x squared plus y squared equals 1. All right, so S2 is given by x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And uh, well, I can perform the same factorization trick and write this as zw equals 1 minus t squared. Uh, over R, these look like hyperbolas, not spheres anymore. But over the complex numbers, OK, they're different. But there's another form which I'm going to find even more useful. Uh, S2 over the complex numbers can also be written in this weird form. Zw is t times 1 minus t. And if you get bored, you can check that this change of variables allows you to do that. All right. So that really doesn't look like a sphere, right? I mean, spheres are x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. <coughs> All right. But I'll claim that this, uh, this, apply, this, this version will will appear more naturally later. OK, so I have these basic objects that I'm interested in studying. And um, now I'd like to put them in a world. So uh, let me enlarge my world. And I really want to think about affine algebraic varieties or equivalently commutative rings. And I'd like to allow myself some arithmetic situations. So I might allow myself to work over the integers sometimes. and. Uh, I'm going to be considering finally presented k-algebras. Right? And I'm going to impose some smoothness condition. And well, let me just say, I'll give some examples of this. Uh, smoothness is sort of has a nice intuitive meaning. But uh, I'm not going to go through the definition right now. And I'm going to consider these objects up to ring homomorphisms. And this gives rise to a notion of isomorphism. Um, so intuitively, I think of algebraic varieties as cut out from affine space, in other words, polynomial rings, by some finite sequence of equations, just like I wrote down the equations before. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. So you're not going to need to know more about varieties than, than what I've just said, I think. Um, but of course, this is a choice. I mean, I can focus on affine varieties. Uh, there are many, many variants of this kind of construction. I could talk about smooth k schemes if I wanted. 
That's something that might come up. Uh, I could allow singularities if I wanted. In topology, I did that. I made some distinction between topological and smooth situations. And uh, maybe you could even allow more complicated constructions if you want. So there's going to be some, some choice of spaces. But what's important is that I have some objects that I really know and love in them. And so what are some examples? Because that's what I'm really going to care about. Well, generalizing what I had for S1 and S2, let me define these quadrics. Uh, I'm going to call them the odd dimensional hyperbolic quadric and the even dimensional one. When n is equal to 1, these are precisely the examples that I wrote down before. And uh, they're isomorphic to the 1 and 2 spheres. Um, let me just observe that part of the reason that I wanted this weird form is that fact about 2 that I mentioned before. I had to invert 2 in various places to get between these forms. And if you look at the standard spheres given by sums of squares, those aren't smooth over z. So there may be less. Uh, anyway, take from that what you will. <clears throat> All right, so this form of the sphere, even though it doesn't really look like a sphere, or maybe I'll say more about that in a moment, uh, you can see this sort of back in the 20s from the work of Dixon. Um, and Dudené in the 1950s has a lot of work on sort of homogeneous spaces under uh, algebraic groups where this kind of stuff come up, comes up. But I don't think I've seen this form explicitly in the literature in general until the early 1980s when it was written down by Mohan Kumar and, uh, and uh, sorry, that should say Madhav Nori, not, not Murthy. All right. So what I'd like to convince you is that these things in algebraic geometry are going to play the same role as spheres in topology. All right. So in topology, I considered spaces up to two kinds of equivalents. On the one hand, I could consider them up to continuous equivalents or homeomorphism, but I also talked about continuous deformations. Algebra geometrically, I can do the same kind of thing, except the unit interval is a little bit harder to work with in algebraic geometry. So let me just insert a parameter t, which is now a formal variable. So in other words, I think about things over the polynomial ring in one variable, and I can talk about deformations parameterized by that, that new parameter. All right. Now, there's a naive way to do it, which is just the way I said. You literally take the notion of homotopy, and you replace the interval by the affine line, and you get some notion of naive homotopy. And then there's a better way to do it, which goes back to the ideas of Morel and Vavotsky. So you start with something like I did, smooth K algebras over some base. <clears throat> and now we make a bunch of choices. So there are variables in our theory. One of the things that we know is that if I have a smooth K algebra, it looks locally like affine space. Now, if you have a manifold, our definition of a manifold is something that locally looked like a Euclidean space. And so in some suitable sense, which involves introducing some new notion of topology, um, smooth K algebras look like affine spaces. So in that sense, they're really like manifolds. And that local structure is really important for the theory. All right. I started with algebras, but when you talk about geometry and you go back to Riemann, we have things like the projective line, which are not affine. And so I'd like to be able to build spaces that are not affine, like the projective line. So I enlarge so we can glue. And uh, I'm going to do this by passing the pre-sheaves of spaces and then just formally imposing some sort of gluing conditions. Um, so I'm going to invert the so-called Misnevich local equivalences. And I'm going to invert the affine line formally, and this realizes to, uh, this gives rise to the moral Vavotsky motivic homotopy theory, uh, which I'm going to call spaces. All right, so nowadays I think inverting the affine line is kind of a controversial thing. Uh, I'd like to just say that it's natural, it comes up, but uh, so let's, let's look at it. Um, so let's do an example. Uh, so remember, we saw that GM was the same thing as this complex one sphere given by ZW equals 1. And let me just observe that every map from the affine line to GM is constant. This is a ring theory fact. Uh, my morphisms, these varieties, are the same thing as ring homomorphisms, but in the opposite direction. And so I want to understand 
uh, what the units in a polynomial ring are, and I can do that. They all come from the ground, from the base ring. And so GM has no maps from the affine line, so you can think of it as a sort of a discrete space in algebraic geometry, <coughs> at least in this world where I'm inverting the affine line. Uh, in contrast, S1 sort of doesn't look discrete at all. It certainly admits uh, a continuous map from the interval. In fact, it's, in a, it's a quotient space of the interval. All right. So when we think algebra geometrically, this one-dimensional quadric behaves very differently from the circle and topology. All right. So let me write down a new sphere. So let me consider that thing that I called Q2. So x, y is z times 1 minus z. And I'm just going to study this by looking at open sets. If I look at the locus where x is not equal to 0, so in other words, if I invert x, then I get a subscheme or a subvariety or a subring, uh, which is whatever you want to call it, which is a1 cross gm. And you can see that by just writing down coordinates. x is invertible, so that gives me the gm coordinate. And z is allowed to be whatever you want, so that gives me the a1 direction. What happens when I plug in x equals 0? Well, if I take x equals 0, the left-hand side becomes 0, and I get z times 1 minus z is 0. So that means you get two components. All right. Each of those components is isomorphic to a1 with the other variable, y. Okay. If I glue in one of those a1s into that a1 cross gm, I actually get an a2. And in fact, that gives me an open cover. So if I take a2 corresponding to removing z equals 1, so uh, that's the bottom left-hand side, or the a2 with z not equal to 0, then their intersection is exactly a1 cross gm. And if I glue those two things together, then those give me q2. All right. So all I'm doing is playing with equations a little bit. Now, we saw a picture like this before when I looked at the two-sphere. There was an upper hemisphere, a lower hemisphere, and something in the middle which looked like a circle across an interval. This, if you squint at it, looks very, very similar. I have a GM, which I called like a circle across an interval, and then two things that were contractible. Because once I've inverted the affine line, I force things like A2 to become equivalent to a point. So if I do the same gluing that I had before and I shrink each of those A2s to a point, then I see that Q2 just formally looks like the suspension of GM, and that's something we've seen in a number of talks this week. All right, so this weird quadric, which I said was smooth over spec Z, is also uh, something that looks like the suspension of a circle. So this allows me to make a definition. I have these two circles, this topological circle, which just comes up from the theory, and this motivic or uh, Tate circle, GM. And I'm going to define motivic spheres to be built up from these kinds of things. All right. So what are these things? Are they weird? What can we say about them? Um, well, we've already seen in a number of talks this week, the first example, if I look at the hyperbolic quadric that I wrote down before, so the thing with sum of xi, y equals 1, uh, that is, in fact, a mot motivic sphere of this form. And in fact, this morning in Fabian's talk, we even saw a proof of that. What's more interesting is the other one, that the weird quadric that I wrote down, sum of that hyperbolic thing equals z times 1 minus z, is, in fact, a sphere also. Uh, and it's this particular sphere, S2NN. So in particular, when n equals 1, that's what I wrote down before. That's the suspension of GM. Uh, which one? Yes. I'll, I mean, the, the open cover that I wrote down before actually allows you to see that. All right. Um, right. OK, so I think Fabian gave this proof this morning. Uh, if you take this quadric, <coughs> then you can project onto the x variable, say, and that gives a map to a n plus 1 minus the origin. And that map is actually Zariski locally trivial with affine space fibers. Uh, so it becomes an isomorphism in this motivic category. And now we can just basically do induction from the, the case that I wrote down before explicitly. 
All right. So uh, even quadrics that I wrote down are kind of interesting. If k is a Dedekind domain, then there's in fact an, well, one of the descriptions I gave of, uh, of the sphere was as a, a homogeneous space. And uh, there's an isomorphism of schemes between the quotient of SO2n plus 1 mod SO2n uh, with Q2n. This is true even if 2 is not invertible. And one of the nice things about this particular form is that it satisfies what's sometimes called affine representability. Uh, if you want to understand what maps in the motivic homotopy category are to this, this sphere, then you can just realize that as morphisms, so actual ring maps, modulo naive homotopy. So maps parameterized by the interval. All right, so I'm going to prove this for you in an easy case. Let's take the case n equals 1. All right, so what is GM? Well, I said it's C of ZZ inverse, but it's also a group, and I could ident identify it as the group of diagonal matrices with determinant 1, so T, T inverse. Okay? And this acts on 2 by 2 matrices with determinant 1, call that SL2, just by left multiplication. All right? So I'd like to study the quotient for that action. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'd like to write down some ring, and that ring should be generated by invariant functions. So you can just multiply and figure out what the invariant functions are. So what are they? Well, when you multiply, you see that the things in the first row get multiplied by t, and the things in the second row get multiplied by t inverse. And so if you multiply something in the first row and something in the second row, you get an invariant function. All right. So what are those? Well, here they are, x11, x21, x11, x22, x12, x21, and x12, x22. And with a little more work, you can show that these generate all the invariant functions. <clears throat> all right, so let me give these some names. Let me write z as x11, x21. And hopefully I've gotten my signs correct. Let me call y minus x12, x22, and z minus x12, x21. And now if you multiply these invariants, so if you take the <coughs> x11, x21, and multiply it by x12, x22, then that's the same thing as x11, x22, x12, x21. And if you use this relation that the determinant is equal to 1 and these names, then you get precisely the equation xy equals z times 1 minus z. All right. So what is the conclusion? Well, I've now worked out what the quotient of SL2 by GM is by writing down these invariant functions. And uh, well, what is SL2 mod GM? Well, SL2 is a double cover of SO3, and SO2 and GM are very, very closely related as well. Uh, and so uh, I've proven that Q2 is SO3 mod SO2. So this is the first interesting case of this. And let me observe that this also gives rise to one of the favorite pieces of geometry in motivic homotopy theory. If I look at the quotient map from SL2 to GM, then that is the motivic Hopf map eta, which has come up in a lot of talks. All right. Um, so this statement, anyway, is in the literature for k a field, but in fact, using uh, some of the results about the Basquillan conjecture for torsors by Sestamisius and Guo and Liu, you can actually do this in this generality. Uh, so that's a pitch for Philippe's talks where he talks about torsors over the affine line. Uh, it's sort of one of the basic ingredients that goes into understanding Basquillan for torsors in this setting. This, this quotient, yes, right. I mean, this proof works over Z and yeah. All right. So, I've ignored talking about contractibles, but let's come back to that story. And I want to consider this even quadric again. So one of the things we observed was that if I removed, in the case when n equals 1, the locus where x equals 0 and z equals, say, 1, I got an affine 2 space. What happens if I do that construction for a higher dimensional quadric? So let me do the same thing. I'm going to remove x1 through xn is equal to 1 minus z is equal to 0. And that's some subscheme of Q2n, some subvariety of Q2n, which is just an affine space. You can just write down the variables. It's an affine space of dimension n, and the coordinates are y1 through yn. All right. So let me remove that space. So this is some 
variety. And let me just observe that it can't possibly be affine if n is bigger than or equal to 2. Why is that? <clears throat> On an affine variety, if you have a function, it always extends across codimension 2 loci. And so I've removed a codimension 2 locus, so this thing isn't determined by its ring of functions. All right, so I'd like to pick an example which goes back to the early 90s in the work of Winkelmann. Uh, so I'd like to realize this x2n as a quotient as well. Um, and what I'm going to claim is that x4 is, in fact, motivic contractible. So it's contractible from the standpoint of motivic homotopy theory. And the way I'm going to show this is I'm going to show that there is a map from something which we know to be contractible, which is affine 5 space, to this thing, which is Zariski locally trivial with affine line fibers. And this is a fun example, so let me go through it. I'm going to use something which is a little bit weird. I'm going to use quotients by additive group actions. So let me look at GA, which is the additive group. So I'm going to think about it in terms of matrices of this form, 1, U, 0, 1. And I'm going to have it act diagonally on A6, or A2 cubed, with these coordinates, x0, x1, y0, y1, and z0, z1. Now you can write down invariants for this action. So if I multiply each of these columns, you'll see that x1, y1, and z1 are invariant functions, because the u is only going to affect the top variable. And likewise, if I take determinants of any pairs, then I'll get an invariant. So the functions x0, y1 minus x1, y0, and so on and so forth are, uh, are GA invariants, so the determinants of any 2 by 2 blocks. Now I'm going to do something a little bit funny. I'm going to look at a GA invariant hypersurface. So I'm going to look at x1 is 1 plus y0, z1 minus y1, z0. This is evidently GA invariant because it's built out of GA invariants. And moreover, because x1 is a variable, the result is necessarily isomorphic to A5. Just write down the coordinates. And you can just use this by writing down these invariants and compute that A5 mod GA is x4. So the quotient by this GA is, is this four-dimensional affine, quasi-affine thing. And it's constructed explicitly as a subset of Q4. And when you do the computation, you see you miss exactly this locus, which I called E2. Um, so this is related to the Hopf map nu. And that's not an accident, but I'm not going to say more about that. But this construction is sort of reminiscent of what we saw in geometric topology. Remember, contractibles could be built as quotients of Euclidean spaces by free actions of the real line. Well, GA is kind of the algebra geometric analog of the real line, acting by translation. And that's exactly what I wrote down, some kind of translation invariant GA action. But let me observe that uh, R bundles in topology are automatically trivial. So if I look at R bundles, then I only get products by R. Whereas in algebraic geometry, GA bundles are not always trivial. They are just Zariski locally trivial. Um, and that's why this x4 couldn't actually be a product. Uh, and in fact, this is related to a very, very deep, oh, more than 50-year-old conjecture. We don't actually know very much about an bundles in general. Uh, if you're an an bundle for n bigger than or equal to 2, we don't know if you're Zariski locally trivial or not. So this is a conjecture due to Igor Dolgochev and Boris Weisweiler. Um, but anyway, I'd like to think that instead of looking at quotients by R actions or Rn actions, maybe what we should do is replace things by Zariski locally trivial An bundles. All right, so let me say just quickly what's true more generally. This variety that I wrote down, x2n, well, for any n bigger than or equal 1, it's A1 contractible. We saw that for n equals 1. I sketched the argument for n equals 2. For n equals uh, n bigger than or equal to 3, it's a little bit harder. And here's where things get really weird. Uh, this space actually carries a non-trivial vector bundle for n bigger than or equal to 2. In fact, the Hopf bundle restricts to a non-trivial rank 2 vector bundle on this. This is very different from topology. You have a tractable variety with non-trivial vector bundles. Uh, and maybe what's worse, uh, for n bigger than or equal to 3, this thing can't possibly be a quotient of an affine space by a translation. So 
let me now just make a bunch of conjectures and start talking about algebraic, this algebraic situation. Uh, you can ask, if I have one of these A1 contractible smooth varieties, then uh, is there a Zariski locally trivial morphism with affine space fibers? OK, so all those examples were in the quasi-affine setting. And remember, we characterized R2 as the unique uh, contractible twofold. It very recently, and this is sort of uh, kind of an embodiment of the dream that there should be some nice relationship between rational curves on algebraic varieties and, uh, and affine lines in A1 homotopy theory, um, you can show that, at least in characteristic zero, the affine plane is characterized as the unique A1 contractible surface. Um, let me just observe that I use this motivic setting because it worked over an arbitrary field or even over the integers. But if I'm working over the complex numbers, then I could talk about the contractibility of the underlying topological space. And there are lots of complex affine surfaces whose complex points are contractible, but by this previous theorem necessarily uh, are not A1 contractible. But in particular, they fail to be isomorphic to A2. Uh, maybe the first example of this is due to CP Ramanujam in 1974. Uh, and then Tom Deek and Petri wrote down explicit hypersurface equations for these kinds of things. Uh, but in any case, there's lots and lots of examples. Um, in 2018, uh, the, uh, Adrian Dubelos and Jean Fazel uh, observed that there are lots and lots of affine A1 contractibles as well. Um, they did this for n equals 3, but their construction can be modified to consider uh, other situations. And so I'll, I'll say it like this, that in every dimension bigger than or equal to 3, the situation actually looks very similar to topology. There are lots and lots of A1 contractible things. So I think when Fabian envisioned the surgery program for algebraic geometry, the hope was to make statements about uh, projective varieties. And I think what we've learned over the last maybe 15 or 20 years is that mm, for geometric questions, motivic homotopy theory seems to be rather more well adapted to affine varieties. For example, we can say lots of things about vector bundles on affine varieties. Um, so let me just make some comment that <clears throat> if X is affine and A1 contractible, and you have one of these Zariski locally trivial uh, affine space bundles, then it's necessarily a product. So this is a conjunction of two facts. Um, this is a result of Susslin and Bass Connell Wright about locally polynomial algebras, and then the motivic homotopy classification of vector bundles. So by Bass Connell Wright or Susslin, uh, any one of these Zariski locally trivial affine space bundles is necessarily going to be a vector bundle. And then because the base is necessarily going to be A1 contractible, we know that on affine varieties, uh, those bundles are trivial. So let's give a very, very explicit conjecture. Let's take this crazy looking hypersurface, x plus x squared y plus z squared plus t cubed is equal to zero. Uh, I conjecture that x cross a n is isomorphic to a n plus three for some n bigger than or equal to one. Uh, this ridiculous equation actually came up rather naturally. Uh, in topology, it's very interesting to look at actions of s1 on s n and ask if they're equivalent to the standard action. Uh, and in algebraic geometry, you can look at actions of GM on affine spaces and ask whether they're equivalent under an automorphism of affine space to the standard action. And this kind of example came up as a potential obstruction to the analysis of the so-called linearization problem in dimension three. And it was important to distinguish this from affine space. It's known that this hypersurface is not isomorphic to A3. It's also known that this hypersurface is A1 contractible, but we don't know anything about its stable situation. What happens when you cross it with affine spaces? Open problem. Let me observe that uh, in positive characteristic, this kind of cancellation question, if you have a variety which is stably isomorphic to affine space, is it isomorphic to affine space, is known to be false in dimensions bigger than equal to three. Uh, and this is fa fa fantastic work of Nina Gupta, uh, who wrote down beautiful counterexamples to this problem. And let me close with some some examples. Um, I want to go back to the spheres. I wrote down these motivic spheres, and uh, I wrote down a bunch of cases where they were given explicitly by hypersurfaces or smooth affine varieties. 
So if I look at these motivic spheres and p is bigger than or equal to 2q, it's not too hard to prove. I mean, I don't even, I don't think this should be called a theorem, but it's an easy consequence of the structure that uh, you can't find a smooth variety which has this homotopy type. On the other hand, if, so we know that there is a model if p is equal to 2q and p is equal to 2q minus 1, what happens when p is less than 2q minus 1? We don't know. We don't, I think people believe that uh, there shouldn't be such a thing, but we have no idea how to prove this. Um, and there's a related question, which is, well, we have these standard spheres. Can we characterize them in some way? Uh, we already know that if you take something like S21, in fact, there are infinitely many pairwise non-isomorphic models. So if I take this small modification of that equation I wrote down, x to the n y equals z times 1 minus z, this gives me, in fact, countably many pairwise non-isomorphic models of S21. And so this leads to my final slide, which is, well, can you do this for higher n? I don't know. Fun problem. Uh, so maybe I'll call this a motivic point gray conjecture. Can you characterize space among A1 contractible varieties in high dimensions? Uh, or is there a, some motivic characterization of these quadrics in dimensions bigger than or equal to 3? Uh, let me just mention that there's been some work on this problem stably. Uh, Vavotsky observed that uh, one-point compactifications make sense in characteristic zero, and so there's some reasonable notion of motivic topology at infinity, like the n space that I mentioned before. Um, so this was worked out in the motivic setting by Wildeshaus, and then Mark Levine had a notion of motivic tubular neighborhoods, and there's a recent work of Frederick Diglis, uh, Adrian Dubalos, and Paul Arno Ostar, who talk about motivic topology at infinity stably as well. But uh, all these problems sort of ignore the question of what happens about unstably, and then you can hope that there's some version of the fundamental group at infinity along the lines of what Fabienne described. All right, so sorry for going over. Let me quit there. <laughs>